Coming up on this week's show, we're coming to you from Daytona Beach and the Coastal Magic Convention, and we've got an interview with author Morgan Bryce. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome, everyone, to episode 178 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Will from willkanaus.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hi, everybody. Now, this episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable group of supporters on Patreon. A very big thank you to Sherry and Diana Lee for joining us recently. We'll have more information on how you can join them at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. So you're definitely going to want to stick around for that. Now, uh, as we recently told you, uh, just a few days ago, we would be <laughs> traveling, <laughs> traveling across the country to the balmy shores of Florida. Uh, here we are. We are in Daytona Beach, uh, wrapping up the Coastal Magic Convention weekend. Um, shall we dive in? Do you just want to, shall we just start talking? Just start talking. Let's just recap. Because what... it is the thing of the week. <laughs> It was, and it was a good week. And even to back up to our patrons, we got to meet Sherry. Sherry was here, mm -hmm. and we got to meet her, which was pretty doggone awesome to meet one of our our newest patrons just days after she she joined the show. So that was cool. Uh, everybody's always told us. I say everybody, mostly Poppy and and Jay, as we've talked about before, told us to come to Coastal, and they were one hundred percent right about how great this Reader Weekend is. Uh, it's a nice mix of authors, gay romance. Uh, there's paranormal, there's uh, urban fantasy, there's sci-fi, uh, uh, there's horror. It's it's an amazing mix. Uh, I think there was about 75 authors, if I counted the, the poster right this morning, uh, who just make this nice weekend with so much diversity across authors. I met people I would have never come across otherwise. And it mm -hmm. was it was really it was awesome. Mm -hmm. Any high level thoughts from you, sir? Well, uh, from uh, before we drill down to the specific <laughs> things that we did over the weekend, um, a couple of weeks back, when well, actually, no, it wasn't that long ago when we were talking to Jay. Yeah, about that was what, just last week. What, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it feels it feels like a lifetime ago, um, <laughs> but not in a bad way. <laughs> Um, when we were talking to Jay and about what we were had planned going into the weekend. Um, I decided to take a rather laissez-faire attitude and just sort of uh, try and be in the moment and, and do what looks interesting, and that's pretty much what did I what I ended up doing, yeah. uh, which left me open to uh, experience um, what Coastal Magic had on offer. I had some terrific conversations with other readers and um, some other writers that I just wouldn't have had a chance to do uh, any other way. So uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah. Jennifer and her crew did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't think it's it, it's not right to say that we'd love to come back sometime. <laughs> for sure. Because I think we had a great time. Yeah. yeah. Shall we shall we, shall we we deep dive? Uh, yeah. Let's get started. So Thursday for us uh, was the Writer's Mini Boot Camp that happened. Uh, Terry Michaels and Damon Swade taught some great classes. Uh, over that weekend, and I know for me, I mean, we won't dive too deep into this because it's it's writer stuff. But uh, Terry's emotional arc class, uh, I think, kind of cracked open for me uh, some things I needed to deal with in the plot for the second hat trick book that I'm going to be revising uh, a little later on this year in my revision project. And then Damon kind of rocked my world uh, with his verbalized class, and just really quickly, what that is, he's also written a book about this. Uh, every character should have a transitive verb, and that is the thing that they do on every single page of the book. Every time they're in a scene, they are doing this verb, whether it is the exact verb or some synonym of that verb. And it all kind of clicked. I've heard variations on that periodically from him in some of his other classes, but it really it clicked, and I wish I knew it in the past. Whether it would have been a year ago or two years ago or in the past, I wish I'd known that because that, again, made things click. Uh, and I was I was so get, glad to get this information. I need to read the book. We've got the book on our Kindle. And I know he's working on a, 
an actual, like, I guess it's a thesaurus or a dictionary or something of verbs and their synonyms and their antonyms and all that stuff. So I was, I was really psyched about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also enjoyed Thursday sort of ramping up to the reader activities of the whole weekend. Um, Terry and Damon are always a delight. We've experienced uh, taking classes with them before. Uh, Once again, they were uh, lovely uh, and informative Mm -hmm. and funny and delightful. And like you, I think there were a couple of times a a penny has dropped for me. So that um, as Terry and Damon both said, they realized this is sort of like... um, uh, a fire hose of information <laughs> when they do classes they 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 throw a lot at you um so it, if they realize you're not going to be able to absorb necessarily all of it but if you're able to take away like one thing one actionable piece of information that you can then use uh in your writing craft then uh then it would be worth it. And I totally agree with them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like Jeff, I think a penny or two dropped this time around for as sure. Well. Yeah. So, uh, I really enjoyed Thursday's, uh, writing boot camp. Yeah. And then Friday things kicked off and got going, uh, for coastal magic. Uh, there was actually a, a gathering on Thursday night, um, to get people kind of welcomed into being here. Uh, but everything got got kicked off really good on on Friday. And as you said, what was so nice about this weekend is we both had some duties to do with moderation of, of some panels. But then there were those moments just to go off and chat with people and to you know sit on a panel. I can't I can't remember the last time at GRL I went and sat down to watch a panel happen because mm-hmm. I'm usually just running around like a crazy person trying to get everything done that I need to get done. And I got to sit. <laughs> And I, I watched these people I had to talk. Sit and enjoy. Yes, it was it was brilliant. Yeah. Um, do you want to run down a little bit of of what we were doing on uh, Friday and and, and kind of go from there? Or? Well, for me specifically, um, I had uh, two panels to moderate on Thursday. Um, the first one was I'm looking at the uh, program for this year's event. Um, the first panel I moderated was uh, about tropes in uh, genre fiction. Uh, Primarily, all of the authors on that particular panel were romance authors. So, you know, that's like my favorite thing in the world (laughs) to talk about. Um, So we had a a fantastic time uh, talking about um, uh, tropes and how they work and what they mean and um, uh, had great interaction between the authors and the audience. Um, So that was an awful lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. And later that afternoon, I also moderated a panel called The Sweet Stuff. And um, I freely admitted when I signed up to moderate this panel (laughs) that I misunderstood what it was about. Uh, But we ended up having a really interesting conversation about uh, specifically about HEAs and HFNs and what each of those two things mean and what the reader uh, expectation is concerning those types of endings, uh, spe- specifically as they relate to um, different genres. Um, so that was r- really interesting. And once again, a, a terrific panel of authors and a really um, engaged and lively audience. Um, some fantastic readers were asking really great questions. So uh, I had a blast on both of those panels. I enjoyed both of yours. I, I was at uh, the trope one for a little bit before I had to disappear to set up for my own uh, that I had to moderate. And I also re- I really liked uh, Sweet Stuff mm-hmm. because I did I like you I didn't know what to expect from that from the description so to hear all that stuff about H F A and H H E A and H F N pick those acronyms yep uh, I had a good time with that uh, I I moderated w- the first of my panels on uh, Friday also with the Gay Fiction Roundup which you could if you had the opportunity you could live stream on our Facebook page and we'll put the link to that in the show notes in case you missed it. That was a terrific lineup of authors mm-hmm. uh, that I had on that panel. Yeah. Uh, and we had a good talk about uh, the genre, where it's gone, where where it looks like it'll be going, what attracts everybody to that genre to write in. Uh, and again, like you had, there was a great uh, discussion that went on with the audience, too, about some aspects of gay fiction, which I really enjoyed. Uh, the afternoon... Uh, the afternoon was a hoot, folks. Uh, everything about the afternoon and into the evening was a big hoot. Uh, we attended. We both attended the Improv Flash Fiction 
panel, and Kiernan Kelly talked a little bit about this when we talked to her uh, back a few episodes ago, about how crazy this panel could be, where they get some basic setup on stories and then have about 20 seconds to start crafting the story. And they start at one end of the table and come down to the other end. And there were five authors who had to click through and keep building on the story that came before them. And it was hilarious. And not only did they do that, and I don't know if this was deliberate or not, not only did they have their stories, but the stories that came after all seemed to build on what they'd heard before in general. It was a riot, people. (laughs) And that had uh, a good mix of authors on it. Uh, with Damon Swade, uh, Lucian Driver, or Diver rather, Kiernan Kelly, uh, Kathy Lyons, Eric R. Asher, and Amy Lane. Kiernan Kelly, folks, was not kidding when she said she's the closer on that panel. It was a hoot. Uh, and we're going to actually have, uh, after we sign off for you guys, uh, we're going to have one of the stories uh, rolled out from beginning to end. So you'll be able to appreciate kind of what happened there. Uh, I know you were a little leery going into flash fiction, but... I, I think you found that as hysterical as I did. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun. Uh, wit- witty witticisms and vulgarities and <laughs> hilarity uh, ensued. It was a wild and crazy panel. Uh, a lot of fun was had by all. Now, Friday was actually capped off with cinema craptastique. And this has become a coastal magic tradition. Uh, every year, Damon Suede hosts a film screening and uh while the movie plays he offers you information and insight and jokes and uh craziness and craziness because (laughs) it's damon uh this year's film was a really strange uh action movie called vikingdom and um oh i Really, there aren't any words. Ooh, it's no. just... <laughs> Dominic Purcell, pre-prison break. It's a super ridiculous movie, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, Damon skewered it mercilessly. And it was uh, brilliant. Throughout the entire evening. Uh, so fun time was had by all. I um, I couldn't make it all the way through. Um, woo, it's, 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 it's a tough movie to sit through. Uh, I ended up going upstairs to get ready for bed, but... Um, I stuck it out. He's Jeff stuck it out. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't leave. I had to know what was <laughs> going to happen to not Chris, Chris Hemsworth Thor. Uh, if you watched our Twitter feed at all Friday night, you saw some of the ridiculousness that I was tweeting in response to the film. Uh, yeah, if you get the chance, well, your mileage with Vikingdom might vary. I'm, I'm not sure I would recommend <laughs> it. I, I don't know about that. I will say, if you want to look at it, <laughs> we'll try to tweet this ahead of Book Lovers Con in New Orleans. Yeah. So you know what the hashtag is, because the home audience can play along. But I don't know if it's really worth your money to maybe rent Vikingdom. So I, I, I don't know. But yeah. my God, Damon's a brilliant person. Though. And if you're going to BLC, make sure to see Cinema Craptastique. Because they're going to do this over again. And they're apparently going to add songs to it for BLC. So, mm, don't know about that. So, Saturday. Changing change the day now. Moving on to Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a couple more activities uh, going on on Saturday. Uh, I was doing another uh, kind of a meet and... I, I, was, I was playing host. I wasn't playing moderator. I was playing host to uh, a group of authors playing Mad Libs. And there were 17 authors in this room, and each of them had to take a piece of their book and pull words out so that folks could make Mad Libs out of them. Uh, and we had we gave away a great prize at that because it was a, a registration for Coastal for next year. This was a hoot. We had Damon Swade actually perform a few Mad Libs before we did the drawing. And it's amazing what can happen to a writer's, you know, Carefully honed words when you're putting in random mm-hmm. verbs and adjectives and other stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I also got to sit to sit down and do a panel to watch it. And then I sat in on the uh, uh, total blank out there, folks. I, romantic suspense panel. Uh, and I had, it was a good c- cross section of folks in this panel uh, with H.D. Smith, Nancy Norcott, Victoria Sue, Karen Rose, and Gail Z. Martin, who will be joining us a little later, and kind of hearing their ideas on how uh, all things romantic suspense kind of work and 
how to set up your mystery and how to set up the romance track. And uh, I really enjoyed that as somebody who's so into romantic suspense these days. Mm-hmm. What was what was your Saturday like? Um, my Saturday was a delight. <laughs> um, I was asked to step in at the last moment uh, and moderate another panel. I got to moderate the comedy and fiction panel. Um, so I didn't have a whole lot prepared, um, but I knew because of the authors that were assigned to that panel, um, my job would be very, very easy. Um, we had a fantastic time with Alyssa Day, Charlie Crochet, uh, Damon Swade, Eric Asher, and Lucy Lennox. They were all on that panel, and they were delightful. Um, it was really interesting because they, um, <laughs> as the conversation uh, moved along, they went to some dark places. They were like, you know, real comedy, it comes from pain and, <laughs> and this sort of <laughs> stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, it wasn't all like a, a laugh a second, although we had a really fantastic time, all of us who were there. but. Yeah. You guys really did, because I, I was in there for a little bit, and then I heard you from next door, because you were often laughing over the romantic <laughs> suspense panel that I was watching. Uh, exactly. So um, after that, we uh, went to the Lunch with an Author event. And of course, that's exactly uh, what you might think it would be. Um, <laughs> uh, all, all of the readers are assigned a table, and you get to sit down and have lunch with an author, and you can like talk and discuss and uh, ask them any questions you want about the books and uh, or the business of, of writing. Um, I sat with Victoria Sue. Uh, she was, um, how long ago? She was a couple of episodes back, if, uh, at least. Yeah, she, she's within the last, like, six months, I think. Mm-hmm. It's been a while. I mean, we've had her on the show, and I had a delightful conversation with her and another reader. Um, who did you sit with? I sat with uh, Macy Blake, oh. a.k.a. Poppy Dennison, uh, and mm-hmm. talked with her a little bit. And also at my table was a new-to-me author, uh, Sonali Dev. Oh yeah, uh, who I've seen, I saw on a, on a previous panel and got to have some lunch with her, and I'm really intrigued now by her books. I may actually pick up something. She does not write uh, gay romance, but she writes uh, romance, uh, het romance, and I was just intrigued by some of the stuff uh, that I heard from her. And there was an interesting conversation at my table about um, her parents. Uh, reading her books and how she provided them the sex-free editions of her books, perhaps, <laughs> to read. Um, and also a little bit about how different people perceive books. Like her father, she was saying, doesn't get like Harry Potter. And, well, why is there magic? What is that? That doesn't make, I don't understand that. And we got into talking about world building and how that works for some people and not. So it was a really good lunch conversation. Good. Cool. Yeah. Um, the... Afternoon was capped off with the author signing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a lot of really terrific people there. Um, everyone in attendance uh, con- converged on the ballroom here in Daytona Beach, and a fun time was certainly had by all. Um, a lot of uh, great people, a lot of signing books. Um, it was fantastic. Yeah, the thing I like about the coastal signing as well is that uh, it's open to the public. Mm-hmm. So at that point, people who live in the Daytona area or the surrounding area can actually come in, uh, have access to the booksellers that are here, see the authors that are here, and, and take part in the convention that way, even if they're not doing the whole weekend. So mm-hmm. the, I like that aspect of it a lot. Mm-hmm. I had a good time. I met some good people. I got to take my podcast hat off and moderator hat off for that event and and don my author hat, if you will, <laughs> and and talk to some people about uh, Codename Winger and about Hockey Player's Heart, and had a really nice time with that. I really enjoyed my seat partner for that, Janine Adams. She writes Het Romance. She's got some YA books. Uh, and we just had a delightful time. In between people talking to us, we were learning about each other and what we wrote and, and, and whatnot. I, I love that. <laughs> and I might actually pick up one of her books, too, because I'm like, hmm, that sounds interesting. <laughs> hmm. Space Station Christmas, I think, was one of her titles. Oh, my God. That sounds amazing. I know, right? <laughs> and the cover was really awesome, too. Yeah. So, yeah, that was Saturday. And it was, it was good. And today, as we record this, it's Sunday, and we've just left the uh, the events. Uh, and I, I, did, I had one last panel to moderate, and I got to do words and music, uh, which was how authors use music either as inspiration for their books or uh, for their characters or if it's just something that kind of floats in the background uh, while they're writing Uh, and that was a great panel and we had uh, Emmy Lane uh, April uh, Alita 
and uh, Todra Kandel. And I loved hearing about how those three use uh, music. Uh, Todra has, uh, her characters actually have a theme song that she gives them. Mm -hmm. And often each chapter has a a song that inspires it. She spoke about, and I, I apologize, I, I'm not going to be able to put this in the show notes because I don't know what book it is. But she mentioned a book that she's done recently where she released an iTunes, uh, an iBooks special edition that each chapter's song was linked within the book. Mm -hmm. So if you had it inside iBooks, you could punch the, the link on it and go listen to that song that yeah. was attached to it. And I'd never heard of that kind of thing and was really intrigued by it. Cool. And what was your last panel for Sunday? Um, I attended one about villains in fiction. Uh, so we talked about, you know, what makes a person bad or not necessarily good, but uh, it was really, it missed, yes, exactly. Misunderstood. <laughs> it was really interesting and a lot of fun. Very well attended panel as well. Hi, I'm Jay from the LGBTQ romance review blog, Joyfully Jay. At Joyfully Jay, we review tons of LGBTQ romance, as well as romantic fiction and nonfiction. We review ebooks, audiobooks, and even the occasional movie. We typically review about 18 books a week, so Joyfully Jay is a great place to hear about new releases, catch up on books you may have missed, and find some new favorites. In addition to our reviews, each weekday we host an author as our first post of the day. This gives readers a chance to learn more about new releases, get exclusive excerpts, find out about the author, and participate in great giveaways. Each author post on Joyfully J is exclusive, so you get access to book and author information you can't find other places. At Joyfully J, we love LGBTQ romance and are excited to share it with you. Stop by the blog at joyfullyj.com. You can also visit us on our Facebook group, The Joyful Jays. We'd love to have you join us. So while we were here, we caught up with Gail Z. Martin, who writes also under the name of Morgan Bryce. Uh, she actually interlocks her world between her two pen names, and it was really awesome to talk to her. So let's get to that interview. So we're here at Coastal Magic in Daytona Beach with Gail Z. Martin, mm -hmm. who MM Romance fans may know as Morgan Bryce. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. This is a blast. Absolutely. we've. I think we've all had a great weekend. Oh, it's been busy. It's been crazy. It's been wonderful. As, as any con is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> How's your Coastal Magic experience been? Oh, it's been wonderful. I've met a lot of new people. I've seen a lot of old friends. I've gotten to talk with a number of authors and bloggers and podcasters, and, and that's... That's kind of everything you want from it. Plus, it's on the beach. I mean, you know, in February and March. This is great. I'm thrilled. Right, because we know so many people came from the Arctic zones yes. of the country. Yes. And, and, and mine wasn't exactly Arctic, but it's, you know, mostly underwater at the moment. So I'll take, I'll take what I can get. <laughs> now, this is not your first coastal. This is about my third, I think. Third? What is it about this con that keeps you coming back year after year? Uh, well, I know Jen from... Um, when she runs the urban fantasy track at Dragon Con. Mm -hmm. So we go back a ways. And she knew me and my urban fantasy pieces from there under the Gale name. And um, I came the first year with just urban fantasy. And then I started writing uh, the Morgan Bryce books last year. Had one book out uh, before Coastal last year. And so um, I love the mix of urban fantasy and romance and... Um, that you've got readers who are looking for a little bit of all of that. And mm -hmm. that kind of describes what I bring with me, a little bit of all of that. A little bit of all that. What's the essentially the origin story of Gail Z. Martin as writer that bridged into Morgan Bryce last year? Well, <laughs> therein hangs a tale. <laughs> so uh, I came late to the party falling in love with the TV show Supernatural. Okay. And I didn't fall for it until halfway through season 11. <laughs> And then we binge watched 11 seasons in four months to be ready for the kickoff of season 12, as one does. And then it went on hiatus. And well, by the way, now I live tweet all the episodes. I run a, a fan group with over 400 people on Facebook. I've been to one of the conventions. I'm going to the DC convention later this year. I've been, a, I've been an invited guest blogger on Winchester Family Business Blog. I, yeah, I went, when I go down a rabbit hole. You are in the Winchester <laughs> business there. <laughs> I haven't fangirled this hard in a long, long time, and it's kind of wonderful. But it went on hiatus, and I 
started reading the fan fiction, which again, I haven't done in ages. And after several hundred of those, I turned a corner and started reading Slash and said, this is really good stuff. And after I'd read a couple hundred of those, at least, <laughs> I said, I wonder what the non-fandom stuff that's that's published is like. And I discovered Jordan Hawk, whom I had actually known under another name for over a decade, and said, oh, that's where you went. And <laughs> Charlie Cochet and, and, you know, so many wonder... K.J. Charles and so many wonderful people writing paranormal male male romance and I said you know my writer brain turned back on and said this is fun I want to do this too and so the only reason for the name change is that in my Morgan Bryce books which are urban fantasy male male paranormal romance there is explicit sex and in my Gail Z. Martin books which are epic fantasy urban fantasy steampunk comedic horror um, there are relationships, but there's no on-screen explicit sex. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't want someone who knew me under one name to pick up the Morgan, the, the romance and, you know, kind of have a heart attack because it wasn't what they were expecting. Right. And this way, it, it's really a branding thing. It's not a secret. It's all over all of my websites. It's, it's in all of my bios. It's just kind of a branding thing so that when you pick up the book, you know what you're getting. And the universe is cross. Oh, yeah. The Gail Z. Martin and the Morgan Bryce universes. Yes, they do, because I can only keep so many universes straight in my head. <laughs> and so um, right now I have two series out with Morgan Bryce. There will be more, hopefully, by the end of the year. But um, the main character in the Badlands series, which is a psychic and a cop in Myrtle Beach solving supernatural killings, he's the cousin of the main character in my Deadly Curiosity series, which is set in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's got a psychometric, someone who can tell the history and magic of objects by touching them, who runs um, an antique shop that's really a cover for a, a coalition of mortals and immortals that get cursed and haunted objects out of the wrong hands. So they're cousins, and, and um, they, you know, they contact each other through the books. They, they talk to each other. That, that's a lot of fun. Um, and Simon serves as a folklore consultant, mythology consultant to the monster hunters in all of my other books, who also show up in his books and the other books, you know, asking questions, helping each other out, going on hunts with each other. So um, in the Witchbane books, Seth, my main character there, will call Simon because he needs some folklore on whatever monster they're going up against. Um, and then, you know, Mark Boychek from the Spell, Salt, and Steel series, which is snarky monster hunting in the wilds of Pennsylvania. That's not a romance, but he's tied into this whole crew. And in the Night Vigil series, which is an ex-priest and a former FBI agent hunting demons in Pittsburgh, they actually show up as uh, major characters in Dark Rivers, which is the third Witchbane, the se- yeah, the third Witchbane novel. Um, and they actually play a major part in that book. And it was funny because just for a variety of timing reasons, Dark Rivers came out with them as basically side characters in it before their own book came out. (laughs) But it's so much fun for me because um, I'm writing all the series, you know, continuously. So it it just seems right to me that they're all contemporary. They might as well be crossing over with each other. They would be in a, a world where they were all doing these things at the same time. And uh, it's less for me to keep straight. And it, it's kind of an Easter egg because if you've read one series and then you see the character pop up, you go, I see what you did there. And then there are some in-jokes for people who have read, mm-hmm. the, you know, the series that, like Simon doesn't know just how much Cassidy's doing in the supernatural world. Um, he just thinks she gets rid of haunted objects. There's a whole big side of this. And Cassidy doesn't really realize how much he's doing. And at some point... They'll find out, and that'll be fun. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, can you tell I'm having a good time with Absolutely. This? I love the enthusiasm for that. And if I if I heard all that right, it's one universe and multiple series that it is. interconnect. It is, and there will be, um, there'll be a new series, Treasure Trail. Yes, I know. Uh, and it <laughs> is, <laughs> it's set in Cape May, and it'll tie into the same, same series. Um, and there'll be... Um, I've also done uh, Steampunk under the Gale name, uh, co-written with my husband Larry. And we'll have, um, I'll have a Morgan Bryce Steampunk Paranormal Historical series out, hopefully later this year, that will tie in to that series. Um, and there's uh, my Assassins of Landria series, which is buddy flick epic fantasy, kind of epic fantasy without the epic length. It's, it's <laughs> two smart mouthed assassins and their valet who break all the rules for the right reasons. There will be a Morgan Bryce spinoff series set in kind of an epic fantasy series because I'm just having too much fun to quit. 
is there like one master list of recommended reading order between all these? <laughs> Somebody just asked me that <laughs> in my world of Morgan Bryce reader group. And I said, okay, guys, listen up. Here it is. And I walked everybody through it. And, and you know, here's here are the way they kind of intercut with each other. Uh, so that that's actually posted in my Worlds of Morgan Bryce Facebook group. What's the reaction been from Gail Martin fans, Gail Z Martin fans? Because we should specify that Gail Martin writes inspirational books, and not me, not not Gail not Z Martin. So make sure you click the right thing on Amazon. The Z is important. <laughs> yes. What have the reaction been to the Gail Z Martin fans as characters that they know and love? come now under Morgan Bryce for those tales? Is is you know, the crossover good and the reaction good? It has been. Um, you know, I, I I didn't know if the two reader groups would, would intersect. I didn't know what the Venn diagram was going to be with that. And so I just said, hey, guys, I'm also doing this over here. And they and there was this small stampede that went, oh, really? Wow. And these Gale <laughs> readers went over to the Morgan stuff. And then after I'd had a couple books out as Morgan, I said, and you guys do know that I write this other stuff over here as Gail. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have the sexy times, but it's got, you know, relationships and all this magic. Oh, really? And there was this small, <laughs> and it's like, well, okay. And so that's been really gratifying. I mean, you know, not every book is, is everybody's cup of tea. Sure. And not all of my urban fantasy readers read the steampunk or read the epic fantasy and vice versa. Um, so, so not everybody who was reading the Gale stuff, read all of the Gale stuff. Mm -hmm. I get that. That's fine. Um, but it, it's been really fun, and other people have said, you know what? I've never read that, but I like all your other books, so I'm going to try it. And now they've discovered a whole new genre. Mm -hmm. Which has is populated, as you noted, with other authors they may branch off to eventually. And, and you know, I'm, I'm huge on cross-promoting other authors, so I tell my fans all the time, you know... I write pretty quickly. My, my goal is kind of getting, you know, a book or so a month done. But I can't publish them that fast. So, by the way, while you're waiting on my next book, here are all my favorite authors. And, mm -hmm. and I love promoting other people's new releases and talking about them. I do my best to get to know other authors because at the end of the day, it, it's a very small world. And, you know, I've had my readers tell me that they read 100 to 200 books a year. Now, I write right. fast, but I don't write that fast. <laughs> right. So they could read all of my books under both names twice and still have an awful lot of reading time left. So, you know, it's, it doesn't do me any harm whatsoever to send them off to all my friends and, and all the books I love reading when mm -hmm. I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's my idea of a good time. Let's talk a little bit about The Rising, which okay. just came out in February. It's the second book in the Badlands series. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of 2.5 or, or sort of 3 because there is the novella um, Lucky Town in between there. And that's kind of important for sequence because that's actually also sort of a Thanksgiving and Christmas novella. I, I noticed when I was researching that it was a Thanksgiving. I always like seeing the holiday stuff get tossed in where mm -hmm. it can go just because it's like... Oh, Christmas moment, you know. Oh, with holidays <laughs> with what? With ghosts, with, with ghosts. supernatural creatures. <laughs> you know, that's just part of the package with me. So, what is happening in the Rising? Well, you've got a huge storm coming in. You've got vengeful pirate ghosts. You've got a haunted mansion with some dark family secrets because this is, after all, the Deep South. And Simon and Vic are doing their best to try to figure out how all of that. Or if all of that has anything to do with this series of, they appear to be suicides, but they're locked room suicides, so the families don't think they are. They, And Simon's contacted the ghosts and gotten enough from them to say, no, they're actually murders made to look like mm -hmm. suicides. So now they're trying to get ahead of a killer, and they're not sure whether that killer is alive or dead. And there's another whole situation going on with the haunted mansion that is, you know, gaining intensity and somebody's going to die. And then somebody, um, there are three antique knives and they start showing up in people's backs. <laughs> and <laughs> the body count is rising, the dead are rising, and the storm is rising. And Simon and Vic are just trying to stay one step ahead and, and try to, you know, cut down on the body count. Mm -hmm. and, and stay alive themselves. Just a little bit to do. And yeah, they've also <laughs> just moved in with each other, so they're still getting used to each other. And, and Simon's adjusting to the fact that 
you know, he's, he's kind of coming face to face with the reality that Vic's a cop and cops have a dangerous business and he's in love with this guy who might not come home one night and, mm-hmm. and how does he deal with that? And Simon, who uh, Vic, who's the cop, is really gaining an appreciation for just how much Simon's psychic abilities with, with um, you know, precog and visions and his ability to talk to the dead and channel the dead as a medium, what those risks are and uh, what kind of danger that puts him in. And so they're, they're both kind of coming to terms with this next step in their relationship, which is a blast for me. That's awesome. And in the Badlands world, Morgan Bryce now has a first audiobook. Yes. As Badlands comes out uh, on March 12th. Yes, and I'm really thrilled with that because all six of the Morgan Bryce books have been sold under contract to Tantor Audio. Mm-hmm. So, um, Cale Williams is the narrator, and uh, so it's been a lot of fun to work with him, and I'm really thrilled seeing the books, you know, come to life in a whole new way. And I'll let you in on a secret. Badlands, Lucky Town, The Rising, the two short stories that are on Prolific Works are Cover Me and uh, Restless Nights. If you didn't pick up on it, Vic is a big Springsteen fan. So okay. he, I, I've had some reviewers go, it's called Badlands, but nobody goes to South Dakota. No. <laughs> Vic, is a, Vic is a big fan of the boss. That's awesome. So there's, <laughs> so there's a playlist in here to be made from these titles. Yes. And the next one is Loose Ends. <laughs> <laughs> Did you also do audio as Gail Z. Martin? So this is just an expansion of the whole universe into audio? or So there's a funny story with that, yes. Uh, almost all of my Gail Z. Martin books have been done on audio, either by the publishers when I was working with, I would worked with a, uh, Orbit Books, which is a big New York publisher. I'd worked with Solaris Books, which is a big London publisher, either as part of the package when they were publishing me, or since we've gone largely indie, except for three series we're doing with Falstaff books, um, I, I wasn't, um, I was just about to dip my toe in the water of doing my own stuff, you know, with, with Hiring Town through ACX. Well, um, then Recorded Books came to my agent and said, oh, cool, new stuff. And we did contracts. I'm cool with that. That's easier for me. Mm-hmm. Well, I might not have mentioned to my agent that we were starting this whole Morgan Bryce new genre because <laughs> I wanted to see how it was going to go. And then Badlands got that nice little orange banner, number one in gay, gay fantasy, and hung there for a while. And recorded books found me and said, hey, by the way, Morgan, we'd really like to talk to you about doing a contract. So I go back to my agent. I was actually at GRL when this happened and said, hey, Ethan, guess what? I started writing these other books and this one's at number one in a category and recorded books uh, sent me this note. You might want to follow up on it from there. (laughs) And, you know, when you're a, I, I absolutely love my agent. I've been with him for 12 years. He's a wonderful, wonderful uh, business partner. And uh, he never missed a beat. And so that's how we ended up with all six Morgan Bryce books under contract. Um, so they, they will all be coming out. And yeah, so all of my Gail Z. Martin stuff, except for, I think there are two books, uh, three books, um, that currently aren't in audio or in production to be in audio. So if you like audio books, um, you can find all the flavors. You can binge. Yes. Binge on the audio. And some of those epic fantasies are binge. They go on for a while. <laughs> so you've been writing a while now. What got you into taking the leap to going to being a published author? What was the what was your what was your origin as a writer? <laughs> well, I've been published for twelve years, but as I tell people, I've been writing forever. Um, I wrote my first story when I was five. My favorite TV show when I was a preschooler was Dark Shadows. I don't know what my mother was thinking, but that was my favorite. You know, other little kids get cardboard boxes and they make them into race cars and planes. (laughs) I made mine into a coffin and rose out of it. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And the first story I ever wrote when I was five, I couldn't write because I couldn't spell yet, but I had my, I dictated it to my grandmother. It was about a vampire. (laughs) What did grandmother think about that? You know, they just kind of went with it. Um, And and really, so none of this should surprise anybody. Um... (laughs) And so I always loved books. I always loved stories. And when I was about 14, I 
kind of thought about, well, where do books come from? Will people write them? And I'd always thought about those author people who write these books. And in 14-year-old kind of thinking, I thought, you know, the people writing books now won't live forever. Someday they'll be dead. And if new people don't start writing books, there won't be any more books. So if n regular normal people can write books, I could be a writer. And at 14, I decided I, I wanted to grow up to write books. So I um, majored in medieval history in college so I could write epic fantasy books because I wanted to do that. And then I knew I'd need a side gig because I didn't want to do the starving in a garret thing. Right. So I no got, one does. <laughs> so I got an MBA and worked in corporate marketing as a side gig for 17 years. Some people wait tables. I wrote annual reports. I still maintain that the annual reports were some of my best fiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did that and then finally left corporate. And all the while, I, I started writing my first book, The Summoner. And I had written fan fiction back in high school. Um, and that was before people passed it around on the internet. We'd go to a convention, everybody would sit on the floor in a hotel room, and we'd just t take one, pass it down, read it, and, and they'd be handwritten, they'd be, you know, Xeroxed. Um, so I, I really fell in love with writing, and I also found out I could entertain people, because people would start pestering me, you know, when are you going to write the next one? And, it, and the first full-length novel I ever wrote was my friends came to me, and they knew I, I wrote all this stuff back in college, and um, they said, you know, we don't want to wait for Return of the Jedi to come out. We want you to write us the next installment because we don't want to wait for the movie. So I did, and that's that taught me I could write a full-length novel. And to this day, there are six people in the world who like my version better than George Lucas's. So nice. There, yeah, six people. Uh, but it taught me I could I could make people happy with writing, and I could finish a project, and I could do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I came up with the idea for the main character in um, The Summoner, which was my first book in the Chronicles of the Necromancer, when I was 19 in college. It only took me till I was 45 to get published. You know, this is what it takes to be an overnight success. Yep. Um, and I would work on the book, and life would happen, and I went to grad school, and life would happen, and I got married, life would happen, children, moves, all this. And the book would come out, and I'd work on it, I'd go back in a drawer. And then finally, when I left corporate, long story, mergers and acquisitions, I said, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm, I need to do it now. And so I dusted it off, cleaned it up, and sent it off to a publisher, and um, it was the right time. Magic happened. I got the agent, I got the publisher, and the main character and the concept had been around so long that at this point, my children considered, <laughs> my daughter told me she always thought of Triss, the main character in The Summoner, as their invisible older brother, because I always talked about him. <laughs> Um, so it's been around that long. Uh, but yeah, pretty much always. And and I'm just so happy and so thrilled and, and so lucky and so blessed to be able to do what I love doing for a living. Mm -hmm. How much did Tris change and the summoner change from essentially what you'd started with at 19 to when it got published? Oh, hugely. There was pretty much the name. <laughs> and, and a little bit of character description. Mm -hmm. um, but not only did my lens and perspective change growing up, um, but through all of the many, many, many revisions, I finally learned how to write. <laughs> and so it was, it, the plot changed, everything really about it changed except the character and, and the description. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there's definitely a thread there. You've got all these series and the interlocking universe. What's your process for, for deciding I'm going to write this book now, then this one, then this one, and these characters, these characters are going to get a Morgan book. These characters are getting a Gail Z. Martin book. How does, how does all that sort itself out? Um, well, some of it is all the series are um, ongoing, at least, they will be for the next year or so. There are, um, I've got one last book to bring out in one of the epic series, one last book to bring out in another epic series. Um, I'm bringing, I'm starting up um, the next six books in the Chronicles series because that had kind of come to an end. Um, I have, in some cases, I have the story arc in my head already for where this series is going. Other series are open ended. Um, but the ones I'm actively writing, I try to bring a book out every year or at least close to every year, um, because I know what it's like as a reader to be mm -hmm. waiting for that next book to come out. And I don't want to keep people waiting any longer than I have to to bring out a good quality book. Um, 
so that's really it. I, I have a mental list of, I'm going to write this first and this and this and this. here's my lineup for the year. I'm already behind and it's beginning of March. Um, but that's okay. And some of it's a sequence of, okay, I've already promised audio, so I need to move that up in the queue because they're going to want the audio sooner rather than later. Um, we're doing three series with uh, Falstaff books, and so there's a little more of a schedule there. But mostly it's me in my head saying, I want to make sure nobody waits more than a year for the next book in the series. And with the Morgan Bryce books, I want to bring books out pretty much every two months um, because romance readers read very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Do you have a big, like, universe Bible so you know what's happened in the, all these books, or is it all in your head? And A lot of it's in my head. And then my, my husband uh, also works full-time in the business with me writing, and, and behind the scenes, he's my best first editor, and he does all the royalty spreadsheets. And, and more and more, we've been at it now for eight years, um, since he left corporate, more and more... Um, Everything's kind of co-written to an extent behind the scenes, some series more than others. Um, so <laughs> he got tired of me saying, okay, who's taller again? Uh, what color are his eyes? Or <laughs> And so now he started the series Bible on that. Um, and, and that's good. But I'm not... Some people have binders and binders and binders of world building and all that. Not That's generally not me. I don't do the file cards. I don't do the binders. I can keep most of that in my head but you know remembering who's taller that, that sometimes trips me yeah, up that's, yeah. that's finite those personal characteristics right and you you don't want it to say flip back and forth from book to book in the same series hey wait I thought you were taller in the last series <laughs> wait your eyes were green over there what just happened you've mentioned a couple times now your husband uh, what's it like to co-write with him how did that how did that come about and was that an easy partnership to have or well, um, obviously he knew about the Tris thing when we got married, so he kind of knew a little bit what, what we were getting into, and we've been married for 31 years. So um, when he was still in corporate and I had left corporate and was writing, um, he really didn't have time to come in on anything until like maybe the next to the last draft and, and give me an extra set of eyeballs on it. Um, but he always wanted, he, he was ready to get out of corporate, and he always wanted to get into the writing piece with it. Um, and he's very talented in his own right, and I think we'll be seeing some more things coming out from him um, very soon. Um, so he kind of eased into it. You know, it, it went from corrections to suggestions to being very active with brainstorming up front and character generation and plot generation to going through a draft and making revisions. And after all this time, we can't tell each other's voices apart when that happens. And on the books that have both of our names on the cover, um, I may do the first draft, but then he'll come in and, and do expand and, and maybe redo whole sections, and it all blends. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's what happens after 32 years. Right. Does it start out as the idea that you're going to write together, or does it is it more he's done so much in the book that his name then goes on it? Part of that is also branding, because some genres um, do better with a male name on them. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are just because we wanted both names on them, um, and he's he's um, doing more and more that is just him. Um, and I'm absolutely encouraging that, but he's not quite at the point to launch that yet. Mm -hmm. So right now it, it's all um, very much jointly done, and uh, a lot of a lot of whether or not it's the name on the front is is uh, branding. And that makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. certainly in the fantasy and sci-fi area, that male name can particularly in sci-fi. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they're they're. Our small bunch of us that are female <laughs> authors in fantasy, uh, the the intrepid crew, um, but it is still very much you know an old boys club, and uh, that's changed a little bit, not tremendously much, but it, it's you know you roll with it, and and I've had you know I've had a wonderful run with sci-fi and fantasy. It's not over yet. I'm still doing quite a bit there, and uh, I love that side of my life, and I, I love those people. Um, it it's just. 
a lot of things work a little differently than they do in the romance side. Mm-hmm. How was it different, other than obviously putting romance mm-hmm. into the books, coming over to MM Romance, meeting those readers, getting to know them as they know as they got to know your work? Um, in a lot of ways, it really wasn't different. And I'd had uh, a male-male couple that plays a very important role in the Deadly Curiosities books all the way through, and everybody, you know, loves Tegan and Anthony. Um, so to an extent, the Morgan Bryce books are, well, what if, Tegan and Anthony had been the main characters in Deadly mm. Curiosities, and the books were as much about their relationship evolving as it is about all the, the magic and supernatural stuff. So in that sense, it wasn't that big of a stretch. Um, and I'd already read all these other authors whose work I really loved. And um, when I went out to my, my readers and said, hey guys, I'm going to be doing this new stuff. Um, who wants to be a beta reader? Who wants to be an ARC reader? Me, me, me. Yeah, I had a lot of, of uh, readers who, who wanted to come in and do that. And um, so really, it, it was, it's a, been a wonderful way to meet a whole lot of new, fantastic people. Um, but in many ways, it isn't that different from, you know, the, the readers that I was working with before, because there's been so much crossover. Mm-hmm. What else is coming immediately for you? So, you know, we talked about <laughs> The Rising coming that was out in February, and we've got Badlands on audio in March. What's, what's like the next, you know, three to six months looking like for your releases on, on both sides of the fence? Sure. Well, um, we're working on the next Spell, Salt, and Steel, which is that snarky monster hunter in Pennsylvania. So that there'll be a new novella out in that. Uh, a new Deadly Curiosities is coming up shortly, and a new... Um, Assassin's Honor, that's that uh, smart mouth assassins um, breaking the rules. And then um, the um, the next Witchbane book, uh, which is uh, Flame and Ash, is coming out. That one's going to be set in Boone, North Carolina, because each book in that series moves around. And then the uh, Treasure Trail, first book in that series, set in Cape May. And that's, uh, again, another Morgan Bryce. And um, then uh, at that point... I'm probably going to have to tackle The Reckoning, which is the third and final book in the Darkhurst um, epic fantasy series, which is Medieval Monster Hunters. Um, and uh, that's one of those big fat fantasy books that is, you know, uh, a doorstop. Yeah, but, the ones you could club people with if necessary. Yes, yes. Slight doubles as a cudgel or a weapon. <laughs> uh, and that's the last one in, in that series. So that's, that's kind of, you know, my dance card for the next yeah. six months. You're busy. Four months, yeah. Well, I <laughs> wouldn't want to do anything else. And what's the best way for people to keep up with both of your pen names? Okay. Uh, well, my um, I've got my Morgan Bryce website, which is morganbryce.com, and my galezmartin.com. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook as, um, well, Gail Z. Martin, but you can find my um, Winter Kingdoms uh, Facebook page and my Worlds of Morgan Bryce uh, Facebook group. And I'm on Twitter as at Gail Z. Martin and at Morgan Bryce Book. Fantastic. We'll put all that good stuff in the show notes <laughs> so people can go click on all of it. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. This, is all, this has been a blast. Thanks again to Morgan for spending a little bit of the coastal magic time with us. I really enjoyed getting to hear her story. It was really awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that'll do it for this week's show. Uh, Before we leave you, did you know that you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon? Well, you can. (laughs) The additional support of our super fans helps pay for the cost of producing and distributing this show. Joining is easy, and you'll get special access to monthly bonus episodes uh, and the opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests uh, and lots more mm-hmm. for all the details simply go to patreon.com slash big gay fiction podcast now coming up next week alice winters is going to join us and she's going to talk about her in darkness series yeah, I, this this has been one of the things i have fallen so hard into with romantic suspense mm-hmm. i adore this series i discovered it because of joel leslie and it was awesome to talk to her so you're not going to want to miss that next week now Earlier, we promised you a listen to one of the stories created during the Flash Fiction panel at Coastal Magic. The authors you're going to hear in this order are Eric R. Asher, Kathy Lyons, Damon Swade, Lucian Driver, Amy Lane, and wrapped up by Kiernan Kelly. They're going to create a story using these prompts. The character's a man, the genre is shifter romance, it's in a futuristic time, and there's a clothes iron 
as a random object. <laughs> I guarantee you, you're about to laugh. <laughs> so guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. So, in the year 24, 24, <laughs> Jim, the plumber, <laughs> found a strange ball of fur in the basement of the very, very futuristic home. <laughs> so, <clears throat> in the intense beam of Jim's flashlight, the ball of fur moved, and he could see giant eyes looking up at him. When I bought that. Oh. <laughs> At first he thought it was a stuffed animal, but then it wasn't. Because the fur ball had teeth. Oh. I hate so, <laughs> so Jim unhooked his sacred weapon. I hate when my sacred weapon. <laughs> And everyone knows that in the year 2424, the most sacred weapon in the world is the iron. <laughs> Imbued with magical properties and forged from iron. <laughs> the iron iron. <laughs> And then, and then, as he pulled out this iron that is shaped as irons are, you know, with the triangle and the boat-like shape, he said a futuristic curse word for <laughs> iron teeth <laughs> with crystal herbal medicine. <laughs> and he said, crap, this is the wrong iron iron. It was supposed to be a golf iron. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with the iron iron? <laughs> then the fur ball leaped up, teeth flashing, and he said, That is my iron iron. I want it now, you thief. And then he leaped with teeth flashing, going straight for the neck. And then <laughs> the fur ball unrolled itself revealing itself to be 11 feet tall and extraordinarily thin. <laughs> its teeth revealed to be body jewelry, piercing every inch of its long, languorous, slippery, furred, contour form. Wrapping itself around the handle of the iron, it yanked the sacred weapon from Jim's calloused, yet strangely manly hand. <laughs> and said, Come with me. I believe there is something inside this pipe if we can both fit within its greasy depths. <laughs> Tugging Jim towards the drain, the furball, whose name was Furball, <laughs> said, as you know, in 2424, we all have the ability to transubstantiate, transmute, and translocate, and shrunk them both to the size of a small uh, Vienna sausage. <laughs> and dragged Jim into the greasy, fetid, lightly moist steps <laughs> of the futuristic septic system. Iron trailing behind them because it had not been shrunk, and so it stuck in the drain just outside. <laughs> and then. Oh my god. <laughs> And then, the iron, which even in 2424 still needed to be plugged in, came Ooh. to the end Ooh. of its plug. Ooh. And they were left with the decision, did they leave the sacred weapon behind and continue on on their own? Mono E, 11 foot tall. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> sausage piece. <laughs> Or did they somehow find a way to shrink the iron iron? <laughs>
Mm. And Furball said to Jim the plumber, you know, if you play with my piercings in just the right way, it creates a, a magical musical resonance that may just shrink matter. It may just shrink. Oh, no, not that way. <laughs> and even more greasy, and even more hairballish. And then... <laughs> <sighs> it loomed in front of them, the giant pulsing, <laughs> testicular bent <laughs> waiting to devour them. And the 11 foot tall former ball of fur said, oh no, it's my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> Detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>